that God has made. Um, but as we prepare to hear God's word this day, let us pray. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Bless the radiant one, O oh my soul. O oh heart of my heart, you are so very great. You are clothed with justice and mercy, arrayed in light as your fine attire. You stretch over the heavens like a tent, your radiance covering the waters. You shine through the clouds and ride on the wings of the wind. The wind, like the breath of life, carries your voice. Fire refines the dross of our souls. You set the earth on its foundation, strong and secure. You covered it with the deep like a garment with many waters that life might come forth. At your word, the waters divided, becoming rivers and lakes and mighty oceans. Storms came to ensure the balance and to renew the earth. The mountains rose, the valleys became low in the places that you did appoint. You brought harmony to all the earth that life might spring forth in abundance. You created springs to flow into the valleys. They flow between the hills giving drink to every creature of the field, quenching their thirst as your living water quenches ours. With the air you have given birds their habitation, they sing among the branches. The majesty of creation is seen throughout the land. The sounds of creation mingle with the music of the spheres. Through your love, grass came forth for the cattle and plants for us to cultivate, that we might have food from the earth and wine, the fruit of the vine oil and healing herbs of many varieties, and bread, our daily sustenance. The trees are watered abundantly and with the sun provide the air we breathe. Every living creature has its home. The birds nest in trees, the wild goats upon the mountaintop. Even the rocks provide protection. You created the moon to mark the tides and seasons, the sun that rises and sets in beauty. In the darkness, when night comes, the creatures of the forest roam the earth. They eat their fill, each according to their need. You provide their food. When the sun rises, they disappear from sight and lie down in their dens. As your people go forth to their work, you are there to guide them. O oh, you who know all hearts, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have created them all. The earth is filled with your creatures. We look to the seas, great and wide, which teem with life innumerable, helping to maintain the balance. Oh, that we might receive your gifts, taking only what is needed with grateful hearts. All of creation looks to you to give them food in due season. When we are in harmony with you, the earth provides. Yes, a bountiful harvest to be shared with all. When we misuse what you have created for us, we blame you for the famine and destruction that ensues and feel alienated from you. Even so, you continue to send forth your spirit and the earth, though not without turmoil, is renewed. The glory of the radiant one endures forever, for the works of love are sure. You are ever present to us, even as the earth trembles, even as the mountains spew forth ashes and smoke. I will, I will abandon, abandon myself, myself into your, your hands as, as long as, as I, I live. live. I will sing, sing praise to you while I have breath. breath. May my meditations be pleasing to you, for I rejoice and am glad in you. May all who feel separated from you open their hearts to new life. Praise, praise the, the creator, creator of the, of the universe. universe. Bless, Bless the heart of my heart, heart. O oh, oh, my, my soul. soul. Amen. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now Psalm 104 is not the only psalm to talk about creation. In fact, there's one theologian that has a work entitled The Earth Story. 
in the Psalms. Reverence for God's work in creation is all over the book of Psalms. Partly because these ancient songs and prayers were written by people who were very aware of their dependence upon the soil. They could not take the actual earth, the soil, for granted. These were people who were directly engaged with the natural world. They also held a very firm doctrine of creation, a God who created all that is out of nothing. A God who created them and all of creation as a gift. Psalm 104 is a cosmic hymn of praise spoken to God. It's a wisdom hymn of creation and ode to creation. It celebrates the diversity of nature, the life that is going on around us day and night. There's an awe and a wonder at creation in this psalm that's unmatched in the rest of Scripture, unless maybe you go to the end of Job. It opens with great praise of God's majesty. And in some translations, God is even invited toward the end to rejoice at God's own handiwork. In this psalm and others like it, there is a celebration of creation, an acknowledgement that matter matters. This is what we are to take from this psalm today. Matter matters. And not just the matter that makes up our physical bodies, but all that we see and touch and smell and hear. In fact, just looking at this psalm and our place within it, in this great ode to creation, well, it helps us understand our relationship to the rest of matter. For the first 13 verses of this psalm, there is not a single syllable that addresses us, humanity's place in the created order. We are nowhere to be found. And when we are finally mentioned, we are considered simply co-inhabitants with the other things of the world. Human beings make up only a small part of this psalm's cosmic concern. We're just one species among many clumped together with every creature, with all matter that is dependent upon and sustained by God. What Psalm 104 does is it celebrates creation is basically negate the human-centeredness of modern culture. It serves as a reminder that the cosmos does not revolve around us, around humankind. It revolves around the earth. All of created, all of the created order, matter matters. All is gift. All is from God. And maybe we are to recognize that usefulness to us is not the only measure of value in the world. This psalmist is prepared to accept that God may have formed other animals for their own sake or out of sheer creative delight. And maybe, just maybe, our relationship with God is bound up in our relationship with the other creatures whom God has made. For the ancient voices of the Psalms, reverence for the earth and reverence for God, well, they could not be separated. One commentary said, this psalm tells us that this planet is the hospitable household of life. Not human life, but life. And all this life is connected and interdependent partners living off the earth. Now, if this is what this psalm is saying, well, it has huge ecological implications for us as a people of faith. It moves us from that dominion-type model and instead gives us a picture of something more integrated, a partnership, a covenant to use our language of faith. 
Our call within this psalm is to work with creation as part of creation so that creation continues on a steady, sustainable course. One of my favorite professors in seminary, Old Testament scholar Ellen Davis, well, she even defined righteousness by saying this. Righteousness means living in humble, careful, and godly relationship with the soil on which the life of every one of us wholly depends. Now she has a sermon where she tells how she got to this definition using the creation accounts found in the book of Genesis. The first two chapters of Genesis, well, they give us two distinct stories of creation from two different authors, perhaps centuries apart. The first one is the one most of us think about, where the days are ordered. Day one, God created this. Day two, God created this. And then we are created in the image of God. In the second account, God forms us, the human being, Adam, from the dust, from the fertile soil, Adama. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return. It isn't some fluke that these two accounts made their way into Scripture side by side. Just look at what we must hold together by having these two accounts as part of our faith story. First, we were created in the image of God. We have a connection on one side of the family tree to the divine. Image of God within us, not so with the rest of creation. But we are also formed from the dust of the earth, the fertile soil. On the other side of the family tree, we have a connection to the soil itself. Shortly after these creation stories telling us what makes us, we have the fall. Another story telling us what makes us, us. Adam and Eve, they seek fulfillment in something other than God. And our relationships, our connections, they're broken. Our connection to God is distorted in need of repair. Our connection to the soil is distorted in need of repair. You shall work the land, Scripture says. And from there, the story of Scripture is God working to mend all the brokenness within creation. So we have something of God in us. But we tend to forget that the soil lays claim upon us as well. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return. The biblical writers understood this. They were very aware of their connection to the soil, not because they were early environmentalists, but because of necessity and survival. They had to be. For theologian Ellen Davis, within the Old Testament, especially Psalms such as 104, the soil comes across more as a relative than a resource. Matter matters. It is to be respected, not just used. There's a celebration of all of life and a call to honor the dignity of all life. A picture given that maybe represents the kind of relationship God envisioned between human creatures and the soil from which they were taken. Now God does take center stage in this psalm. We meet our God as one who has an active role within creation, as provider, and as one who continually renews creation. God as sustainer. God's breath taken and sent forth generates new life and renewal. We get the sense that the psalmist's purpose is for God to rejoice in God's creation and a call for God to remain ever faithful in sustaining life as a labor of love, as an act of unbounded joy. And we, well, we are the recipients of this grace, the gift of creation. 
Psalm 104 tells us that matter matters because it's God's matter. Made not as a temporary ornament for a world doomed to decay and death, but as the raw material for the new world full of glory. The material world matters. Our human material bodies matter because the God who made them will remake them. God made this world and has no intention of abandoning it. So in this truth, may we be a people who love and live like matter matters. May we be like the psalmist and find a way to celebrate this gift of creation. May we, as Ellen Davis says, watch it and watch over it as one who has something to teach us and yet at the same time needs our vigilant care. <coughs> Amen.